Boom. All right. We have Quinn Hennick. Sam's joining us as well. Quinn, thanks for coming on, man. Um, this is now going to be video recorded. So can you give a brief description on the painting behind you and the meaning behind it? Sure. Uh, well, we can just make up a meaning. Okay. But a patient gave me that. And I'm unclear if they painted it themselves or not. Um, we can say it's like a, I don't know, space thing or maybe an ocean thing because it's blue. Yeah, it looks like a galaxy. Like, yeah, it's got a good, it's got a good background vibe, kind of abstract, you know, 100%. so it just kind of sits there. And, but yeah, Calming. just a gift. Blue. Mm. Sorry. Perfect. Uh, well, on that it note. means it, it means have a good pro clinical process. <laughs> it mm. means critical thinking whole. Got it. All right, let's get serious. What? Tell us about you, Quinn. What's your current roles? Tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll go into the primary topics for today. Yeah, I'm a, a physical therapist, physiotherapist for your international listeners. Um, I've been. I've been out of school for, it'll be 10 years this August, and um, I'm currently based in Southern California. I, um, I, up to this point, I've had offices inside of strength and conditioning facilities, weightlifting gyms, all through my clinical career, um, and I've kind of now more of a consulting role in clinic and have been acting more remotely, at least for the past year. Um, which could change, but that's just kind of where I am right now. And then running the the uh, clinical athlete and Calu kind of education side of things online with our with our virtual communities, which is always fun. Um, so yeah, just kind of right now, kind of a combination of um, working with still working with clients and and athletes and um, doing the whole mentorship stuff, which is, it, it's a good time. I'm enjoying the diversity good so the thing i primarily wanted to chat about was this new and uh evolving foundations two course with cal U. and i want to dive into the kind of the topics and subsections of part of the course so maybe can you give a, a background on what is cal U foundations one and what is the goal for foundations two and then we can kind of go piece by piece yeah. And so Calu and you say Cal U, I say Calu, it's all good. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's whatever you want. Um, the foundations one is the previously, previously level up initiative mentorship. So it's the free four month. It, it is cohort style, you know, that may change over time, but essentially it's, for any student or clinician that kind of wants to um, up their game and just kind of have a creative foundation for kind of big picture principles like critical thinking and communication and exercise prescription. And that was the new addition from the Level Up Mentorship to the Calu Foundations One Mentorship, which is what it's called now, is the addition of an exercise module. So I've got a lecture in there. Scott Morrison ha has a lecture in there. And Zach Gabor has a lecture in there. Uh, but it's exercise prescription centric, but it's my lecture in particular is called um, creating your exercise prescription process beyond the methods or beyond sets and reps. And so the idea is, um, you know, what rather than tinkering at the margins and arguing about, you know, what's better, three sets of six or three sets of eight, what are the underlying first principles that that govern your exercise prescription in the first place. And so that short lecture, you know, my lecture in the foundations, one mentorship is like 45 minutes long, but it kind of sets the stage. And then foundations two is essentially that same idea, but blown up into a, okay, how do we put this into practice over time? Um, getting eventually getting into the methods and, and tinkering at the margins, but where, where do we start? Let's build to that first instead of instead of starting there. And then that's that's kind of the um, the crux of the course is is helping people to build their mental model 
of exercise prescription and so that they can apply that those ideas to whatever paper uh, patient population that they see in in whatever setting and then they can kind of manipulate the methods from there if that makes sense that does make sense and i'm currently going through foundations too and you're laying this out over multiple months and yeah. only putting out a few videos and topics at a time the first big picture thing that you discuss and talk about in foundations two is complex systems and the nature of humans and the in whole environment as a complex system. So can you go and dive a little bit into how would you define complex system and why did you even start this, uh, foundations two with that as the primary starting point? Yeah, it's, always a uh i don't know it's 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 always difficult to start with those very abstract concepts because you feel like they're so important but yet you haven't yet laid con context within them and so it's almost just this like it 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 kind of goes if you're not familiar with the concepts or you don't have kind of context of why they're relevant to your circumstance and it's hard to uh it's hard to relate so i the reason I started with even defining what a system is and, and what complexity is, is because that's what we deal with every day. And I, f and I feel that a lot of the trouble that clinicians have in practice or the questions that they have, or, you know, wondering why unpredictability happens and, and things can't be explained is because they're dealing with complex systems. And so I wanted to lay out that idea right off the bat so that we could always come back to this idea and these characteristics and traits of, of complexity when we start to get into the clinical, more uh, kind of clinical context of things. And we can kind of go back to, okay, so we talked about, you know, this is, this is why this tends to happen or, or this is why prediction is difficult. And, and so I just wanted to lay that groundwork right away. And I tried to make it as, digestible as possible because you all know that that those types of concepts can really go into the weeds and so for me it was just you know defining a system which is really what you know the clinician and client relationship is a system your exercise prescription process is a system and a system simply being uh something that has parts those parts are interconnected in some way and there's a, and then they serve a purpose. The system has a function and a purpose. So those three components can define a system and a system can be simple, a si simple system with very few parts and predictability that you can, you can take the parts away. You can put them back together and it functions the same, like a piping system or, um, you know, any, like a knife, pocket knife. Unscrew it, take all the pieces together, put it back together. Boom. It's got a system. It's got parts they interconnect in a way, but the, but the parts pretty much explain the whole or can explain, it can be, can be predicted. Whereas a complex system, the parts don't explain the whole. So in the course, I use the example. I first use the example of the phenomenon of consciousness, where if we just look at the constituents of the human brain, We've got lots of parts in the forms of cells and neurons and, and, and uh, fat and all sorts of things, fluids, and they definitely interconnect and they serve a purpose. The brain serves a purpose to, to help to uh, control the body. But, you know, where does conscious, how does that emerge? You know, how do we explain that from just the sum of its parts? And we can't. Um, the, you know, this, you can think of lots of, of different instances of complex, of complexity of this idea of emerging patterns. And that's kind of one of the characteristics and the hallmarks of a complex system is that the sum of the parts does not explain the whole. So the stock market, um, you know, human, human movement in general. Um, what if we, if we take apart all of the, the bones and, and all of these things, we don't, our, our movement patterns aren't, are still not going to be all that predictable. So, Complex system, number one, 
the sum doesn't doesn't explain the whole the sum of the parts don't explain the whole and there's self organization within that and one example that I could use is simply somebody walking on a treadmill and if you speed up the treadmill one little press of a button at a time your walking speed will increase relatively linearly but then at some critical threshold you'll start to turn you'll start to trot all of a sudden your body will self-organize and you'll start to jog um, and self-organization that emergence of a new pattern again is kind of a hallmark of a complex system where the input and the output are not necessarily linear so in that case the input the speed of the treadmill increased linearly and my walking speed increased linearly but then at some critical threshold all of a sudden the output is nonlinear and so i and so those are kind of the big picture traits of a complex system that i tried to explain in that first part of the course because i think a lot of those traits come up in clinical practice and we tend to see clinical practice and adaptation and all of these things as linear processes and when setbacks happen or when the output is nonlinear to the input, we we're like, what the heck is going on? Because we're looking through a linear lens. But if, if we can understand that, no, okay, we're dealing with nonlinear dynamics here. We're dealing with a complex system. Things are going to emerge and there's going to be multiple factors at play. The, the sum does not of the of all of these factors does not equal the whole. There's going to be factors that we don't even, aren't even aware of that are contributing. When at least we acknowledge that that is the case, then I think addressing some of these um, difficulties in practice, it becomes it becomes easier, and we put kind of less pressure on ourselves as clinician to try to control all of those things, which we know that we can. Um, so also, I don't even know what you asked originally. So I'm just going to stop there. <clears throat> that was great. So the next section, you dive into like, what is a systems thinker? And you're kind of, you've already alluded to that, but you had mentioned that there's value in reductionism within a complex system in times when it's necessary. Can you use yeah. kind of healthcare and uh, rehab related examples of when you need or should probably reduce something that's highly complex? Yeah, so we've got these idea, these concepts of reductionism and holism. So if we just said that a system is made up of parts, then reductionism is by definition taking those, taking a look at each part individually and then trying to study that part and make assumptions of how it affects the whole. And so, which is easier to do in a, in a simple system, in a more predictable system, um, more difficult to do in a complex system, because again, we don't exactly know when you take out a part, the function of that part may change when it's a part of the whole, when it's interacting with these other factors that may have a completely different or magnified effect versus when it's in isolation. So reductionism is trying to look at the parts of the whole just as a simple definition now it's not inherently bad i think reductionism as a term is one of those things that almost comes with a negative connotation just automatically but it's it's in itself not a bad thing we we practice reductionism literally with everything we talk about because we just can't fathom like the world and we have we don't have the perception to be able to to uh, explain everything that's going on so we reduce the 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 complexity of the world by by even talking about it so reductionism is what we do um, now in clinical practice you know we see reductionism simply by if if the study of tendons you know looking at looking at the patellar tendon and the strain stress strain curve of the patellar tendon in isolation is an example of reductionism. We say, oh, okay, the stress strain curve of a patellar tendon looks like this, but that doesn't necessarily explain the stress strain curve when that tendon is attached to a muscle and when it's performing certain actions uh, in actual movement, the, those dynamics may change. So understanding the, the individual constituents of a, of a tendon in isolation is, 
is useful to just create kind of a general understanding, but then we need to understand that those dynamics might change when that part is now put back into the whole. And, and we can say that about, you know, every part of the body when we try to look at it in isolation versus how it actually interacts with the whole system. And a systems thinker is able to zoom in, but also able to zoom out. And they, and they, they don't just assume that this part is going to behave as part of the whole in the exact way that it behaved as part as a part. And we also know that zooming out is we may miss, we may miss some things. So if, if we look at like, you know, post-op, I always go back to the ACL. It's an easy example, but post-op ACL, if we zoom out to just thinking about big picture patterns and, um, you know, is this person confident? Well, we also know that quad knee extension torque deficits can hide. And, and the body is really, really good at, at using different movement compensation strategies. So a reductionism in that clinical sense might be, you know what, I actually want to see what, get them on the knee extension machine or, or testing and isolating that particular factor. Um, understanding that if they can produce torque during a knee extension, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to integrate that and use it on the field, but it's a component that we want to at least tick off the box. So we zoom in and we reduce this, this person down to the part. And this part is just the knee extend extension torque at the knee. Um, and then we zoom out and, and look for that person to be able to integrate that into their, you know, into their desired activities. But the big picture thing is to not look at reductionism as bad. Just look at reductionism as what it is, kind of a, a study of the parts of the whole. And then come in that with the assumption that that doesn't explain, looking at any particular individual part is not going to explain the whole. You just start with that. You keep that idea in your mind. Um, and then you, you zoom in, you zoom out as you need to. And one mental model that I use in the course is just this idea of a systems hierarchy. And if you Google systems hierarchy, complex systems hierarchy, you'll get some pretty cool visuals of this, but it's, it's the idea that you can zoom out indefinitely and you can zoom out, you can zoom in indefinitely, you can zoom out indefinitely. So we could look at the cell of a tendon, but we can zoom in even further than that and look at the constituents of a cell and then what's making up those constituents. And then all, we're all the way down to like quarks and whatever is smaller than that. I'm not, I'm not a quantum physicist, so I don't know. Well, we can zoom out and we can keep going, but we could zoom out from the cell and look at the, the fibril and then look at the tendon as a whole, then look at the musculotendinal tendinous junction and then look at the entire leg and then look at the entire human and then look at the human as it's interacting in a chaotic field environment and then zoom out and look at the, the societal pressures of the sport that they play. And, and so, you know, all the way out to the galaxy. So again, the systems thinkers job is to know kind of where the bandwidth of zooming in and zooming out is, is relevant to their person. Obviously if you start zooming out to the atmosphere, then this person with patellar pain, this no longer becomes relevant. If we zoom all the way into the tendon fibril, is that really all that relevant? So that's kind of the idea and using that systems hierarchy as, okay, I'm intervening at the, I understand I'm intervening at the tissue level with this particular exercise or with this particular dosage. And then I zoom out and maybe part of my intervention is I'm intervening at the pattern level um, with running or jumping or we're working on change of direction or something like that. And then the sport coach may say, okay, I'm working at, I'm, I'm going out and working at kind of the, um, you know, sociological level. It could even just be agility or you interacting with the other players on the field. Uh, so, that's a systems thinker kind of in a nutshell is being able to surf that hierarchy. I feel like that could also parallel looking at research from a systems thinking perspective, like yeah. the in depth as these mechanistic studies or rat or animal models as zooming probably as far in as possible and then zooming all the way out at like 
clinical practice guidelines, systematic reviews, consensus statements, uh-huh. and realizing the inherent flaws or just realities within that whole spectrum. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great example. And, and again, you know, anytime somebody cites an animal study, you're going to some in the comments, you know, you're going to be like, oh, animal study doesn't matter, but it's not, again, the animal study isn't inherently bad. Sometimes it's necessary to start there. You know, there's just some things that we can't look at in humans and they're okay currently okay with us looking at it in rats or whatever, but it's, it's just a, a piece of the puzzle. And so you don't look at it. You're not going to look at any particular research paper as, as the end all be all to, to your, all your answers anyway. So if you can, if you can look at research as just kind of a whole entire process, oh, and say, okay, this animal study is at one level of the hierarchy of the system's hierarchy. And like, like you said, Chris, that animal study might be a, a part of a whole line of research that ends in this clinical practice guideline um, that we also know is, is based on a bunch of authors. A lot of it is based on a bunch of authors' opinion, which itself is not good or bad. You just understand kind of the assumptions that come with that. So very much so. And I, and I use a research kind of example in the course where I say you get up and, you know, you're at a scientific conference and a researcher talks about their favorite um, cell or part of a cell. And then another researcher gets up and says, this is my favorite part of the cell. And then, and then I show a big picture of, of an entire cell and each molecule that the researchers were talking about is one like little bitty ass dot. And that's just a cell, you know? So, but we PTs do this all the time as well. Our favorite exercise for this. Um, another person will say, well, my favorite exercise is this. And so we're the level where we haven't dug into is what's the level below and, and what are the principles that guide your thought process, you know, which is kind of a, probably another question, but very, so I think, I think that that's a really good, um, mental model to use for kind of appraising research and, and appraising really anything when you're learning something new is, is kind of like, where are we in the level, in the, in the hierarchical level here? Um, and be when you're zoomed way in, don't get too stuck and, and just remember to, to zoom out and, and try to look at that in context of the bigger picture of whatever the topic is. And um, when you're, if you feel like you've been big picture for a while, but you don't quite have a, a specific understanding or a certain grasp of a, of a particular detail, then zoom in, you know, dive into that. Um, just again, don't get stuck. So you're able to go back and forth. Yeah, I love that idea. I've been researching a lot about deep gluteal syndrome the last while. And uh, as I've been going through it, there's a lot of information that's presented about how it's this non-discogenic effect that occurs in the posterior hip region. However, some of that didn't line up appropriately with some of the prior information I had read about um, radiculopathies. And so then I wanted to understand more about nerve function. And so I spent the last few days just like diving extremely deep into nerve modeling and research studies in animals because, you know, most of them are where they do essentially uh, nerve death through specific uh, effects to see how nerves respond, which we're not going to be able to do in humans. And I found it like a very interesting time of, you know, this is an extremely reductionist standpoint where you know, at first glance, some of it might not seem how it's very practical, but it's highlighting limitations in some of the further zoomed out way that we speak about the condition. And hopefully I'm able to then, you know, step back and relate it over to the bigger picture. And that is such a, it's a, such a time consuming process, but if you, if you can really, and that's, but that's also why this stuff, like real true learning takes a long time. Cause you're like chipping away and you find a new layer and that, that whole thing of like, I really didn't realize how much I, I didn't know until I started to learn more. That's a really good example of that because you start to, you start to realize, wait, in order for me to even like grasp this, I need to dig deeper here. And so you went to, you know, nerve dynamics. Um, and, and you might come full circle and end up having not really cha- like on the outside, Maybe then your 
your actual practice doesn't look all that different after having taken that journey, but your understanding, your now your overall understanding has broadened and that affects your confidence, that affects your ability to communicate with those people. Um, it, it's, it's like that saying where the locksmith who charges like $400 and is able to unlock the lock in like 10 seconds. And they're like, why do you charge me so much? You've, you know, you only worked for 10 seconds. And, and the, and the person says, well, I've been training for the past 10 years to be able to, you know, to earn, to be able to unlock this thing in 10 seconds. And you only know, you only have context when you get the rookie who can't, who's, you know, takes an hour and a half and is just still fumbling around with that lock. You're like, Oh, okay. I get it. So yeah, I feel like that's a really good example, Sam. And, and that takes a lot of willpower because you're an effort because you're investing like the return is not immediate with something like that type of deep dive. Like you're not going to get more clients from that particular deep dive immediately. Like you're not going to even get con necessarily content ideas because it's going to be such like, you'd be like, how do I even start? Like, you know, so it, it, those types of things pay off in the long run. I think one where we can have fun conversations like this, but like when you accumulate that type of time on a, a myriad of different topics, I think it really, really sets you up well to, to kind of go anywhere where you want with your, with your learning. I'm curious, Quinn and Sam, what do you think has been the topic that you've gone down and explored the furthest and for the most amount of time? Ooh, Sam, you got an idea? That's a really hard question. Um, I'd probably actually say cellular signaling for the interference effect. I've spent a considerable amount of time to have it not inform any changes either, which is unfortunate. Um, <laughs> in some ways, I guess I feel confident in the subject. Um, it didn't create a meaningful change in anything that I would normally do, but I spent probably close to a month reading exclusively about it and diving into probably close to 50 papers in a textbook. I've got, um, I would probably say tendons, um, tendon adaptation to mechanical load, tendinopathy as a, as a diagnosis, as a pain condition. And I've got a lot of like, I, what I'll do is let's say like, you'll take the kind of the topics that you dove into Sam or any new topic. I've got these Google docs that are kind of like living, basically brain dumps. Um, and I try to keep like the top of the Google doc as my current understanding of the topic. Like my, like, what do I have at my fingertips? What, what could I tell you? What could we talk about right now without me having to do any prep? And uh, we just haven't, we're just having a conversation, you know, at dinner or whatever. So that's kind of what I try to keep. And then also within that is the questions that I still have about a topic. Um, and so I'm just kind of thinking about which Google doc is the most like <laughs> just just dumped on, dumped in. If somebody saw it, they'd be like, what is this? It's probably tendons and that, and that realm, which has turned into like plyos and all, and, and all that stuff. But, um, just have a, man, that topic in particular is, is interesting to me because not to get too far field here, but tendinopathy is a pain condition. Like people don't come into the office saying, Hey, you know what? I think I have decreased tendon stiffness, but they feel good. No, they come in because it hurts. And stiffness and all of these all of these part attributes may or may not actually matter and be they may or may not be factors in the presentation and also may or may not have to change as part of increasing function and improving rehab outcomes and a lot of them we can't measure um, and it's like stiffness for example is like this thing that we always talk about as kind of like the the focal biomotor quality, but yet like who's measuring stiffness in the clinic? Not a lot of people. So that's just kind of, that's one. So that's an example. And that's why I dive so deep into it is because just trying to like understand the clinical relevance and also trying to like refine my questions. And I'll go back. What I'll do is I'll go back 
and be like, do I still have, has this question been answered yet? And so if I can't read a paper or something, I'll put it like a link that I found like, oh, this might, this might, this might help me answer. And so I'll dump that link there in the Google doc and who knows when I'll actually get to it. But I think, yeah, I would say, I would say tendinopathy. I can remember back in the old clinical athlete forum when you started, I think you started the, um, tendinopathy thread that then yeah. like spiraled into like, are we actually creating a stiffness change? How do we create a stiffness change? Which direction does it move? Which direction is desirable? I have the same question, yeah. Sam. <laughs> it's been, it's been a little bit and I still have those questions. So after the systems thinking and complex systems, you go into comp, you go into principles and methods. Can you differentiate between principles and methods? Yeah. Um, so I'll use, I'll use the example that I use in the course. Um, I'll use and I use blood flow restriction training. And so if, and if people aren't familiar with that, it's fine. Um, I won't go into the, the, the logistics of blood flow restriction training, but I think you'll understand the concept anyway. So in, in the blood flow restriction training literature, I'm going to, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, but there's, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of studies that'll show that low load, low external load training with blood flow restriction creates more hypertrophy gains than low load external, low load resistance training by itself. So you have two groups that are using like 30% of one rep max and they do the same amount of reps. One group has blood flow restriction training. There's a lot of research, a lot of studies that show that blood flow restriction training group is going to have better hypertrophy and, and strength to, to some degree as well. And so you're like, oh, okay. So at light loads and I need to do blood flow restriction training to build hypertrophy. Blood flow restriction training will call the method. Like I need to slap this cuff on to get hypertrophy. This is, this is my tool. But you then come across a paper that, that had two groups, low load external rotation or external uh, load resistance training, low load resistance training with BFR and the hypertrophy gains were equal. And you're like, well, what the heck? Did I misread that prior study or that prior group of studies? And you, when you dig deeper, you say, oh, no, they, they did this differently in this new study that I saw. They didn't equate the, the reps. They equated intensity of effort. So instead of both groups doing the same amount of volume, one group gets BFR, BFR wins. In this study and in this group of studies, because there's a lot of them, both groups went to muscular momentary failure. So actually the non BFR group did more volume. They did more reps to get there, but both groups went to the same degree of momentary muscular failure. Then hypertrophy and strength were, were pretty equal between groups. And there's a whole group of studies like that. So the principle then is not to use BFR. BFR is just a method to get there faster. But the principle is at some level of intensity of effort, intensity of effort is being the principle, being, being, if we dig deeper, dig, 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 what's the real mechanism here? Intensity of effort. When intensity of, to, to further build onto that principle, when intensity of, of effort is not sufficient, then I can slap on a method like BFR to take us there. So the example then is not just looking at the tool as the thing that is equal to hypertrophy, but rather look at dig beyond that and look at the dosage and look at the application of the exercise as, as kind of the main, as the main principle in, in the second scenario, the tool was intensity of effort. In the first scenario, the tool was blood flow restriction training, but the overall principle is dosage and exercise application. So that's the, that's one of the examples I use 
um, or think of methods as kind of how you carry something out. And the, the principle is the, is the why behind it is kind of, is, is the mechanism behind it. And the method could be many. So if, um, if again, we'll go back to our ACL example, if knee extension torque is your, is what you want, the principle, your principle, defining principle could be simply increasing the torque demand at the knee. So increasing the external moment arm so that the quad has to work. Well, there's a lot of methods to carry that out. Yes, you could do knee extensions. Yeah, you could do a wall slide squat. Um, you could do a heels elevated squat as long as you keep that knee forward. So there's, you could start listing exercises as your method, as your way to carry out the principle. But your big picture principle was, was biomechanics to, to carry out the goal. Um, go ahead, Chris. <clears throat> you have something to say? Can principles... Yeah, can principles be wrong? Oh yeah, I mean gravity is, you know, starts to fall apart at light speed. So I mean <laughs> it's it's all these are all models. These are and they're all they're all somewhat limited. So I use the idea of biomechanics as Newton's because because Newton's mechanics work really well on Earth and they work really well um when gravity is present the way that when gravity is a constant, the way that we know it here on earth. And so in that case, the principle is a law. Um, but at a, in a certain instance or a certain environment or in certain circumstances, then it, then it would be wrong. So I think the, the more you dig, the less, the less, um, uncertainty there is. Like if we, if we dig all the way to gravity, there's going to be less arguments and, and counter arguments to that. If we dig to, well, the glute, it's actually the, the glute that we need to control the knee, you know, in ACL land. Well, now we've got a lot more room. If somebody's principle might be glute, 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 glute. Like there are some prominent researchers out there that say, no, it's the, it's the glute that's the driving factor. And so carry out methods that will train the hips and the hips will control the knee regional interdependence but that's gonna that leaves the door open to a lot more discussion because there's probably a lot more counter evidence to it so a, a principle yeah chris like universal principles uh i mean i don't know if that exists because you know einstein had some detractors and and uh so did newton obviously so I think, but I think what it does is it, it even using those print, those uh, terms at least allows us to have a conversation instead of arguing. If we argue methods, it's like, it's really hard to, to progress the conversation forward because again, it's like, well, no, I use sets of five. Well, no, I use undulating. I use linear, you know, periodization sets of five. Okay. Well, I use undulate daily undulating periodization and I use fours and then sixes and then eights. And then you're like, well, <laughs> sometimes I use sets of 10 <laughs> and, and, and it's just, there's no, there's no, um, there's no, I guess, found, I don't want to use that same word, but there's no, there's no foundation to kind of go beyond the toolbox because where who's using the toolbox is the, is the clinician is the craftsman. So like, why does the craftsman choose this particular tool? Why does the craftsman know that this tool and this tool will actually do the same job and this tool he just likes because he had it, he's had it for longer, or he knows that this particular job, um, the, the constraints of the job itself, this tool would have worked in a, in a prior scenario, but the space is too too narrow. So now he use, he needs to use this tool. And those, those decisions that he's making are based on are principle based. And then the tool he uses is just one way likely to carry that out, but he could have a conversation with a craftsman with another craftsman or she, and they could, they could have conversations about those questions that they ask themselves at a much deeper level than, you know, which, which wrench, they actually ended up 
taking because that's again kind of tinkering at the margins because the other guys or gals wrench probably does the job just as well but they got it from a different store okay nice uh, half of that i blacked out i had bilateral hamstring crap uh hamstring cramps so yeah. strong cramps um <laughs> But anyways, we'll move on. Theories and models. Pardon? Are you like tensed up or something? Why don't you just relax? No, I just I just flexed both my knees and they both immediately started cramping. Damn. I know. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, let's go into theories and models. So you maybe we differentiate first between theories and hypotheses. And then we can elaborate on models. Yeah. So gravity is a theory. Um, so a theory, just kind of the, the knowledge that we have on a particular topic, um, observed and studied over a course of a period of time. Um, a hypothesis is just that an idea that potentially based on prior theory, based on existing knowledge, or potentially to create exist to create knowledge, to create a theory, um, to, to branch off. So there's, you know, still hypotheses being made about gravity and, and tested about gravity. And there were hypotheses made before gravity was, was a concept that we had in our minds. So, you know, when somebody says, well, I have a theory about this, they really mean that I have a hypothesis about this and that hypothesis, you know, could be probably be tested in some way. So um, we think of a theory as just kind of the body of knowledge on a particular topic <clears throat> and hypotheses help to continue to drive that body of knowledge one way or another. And a model is, I, I mean, think about, you know, like an airplane model is, is a way to represent that information in some capacity. So you can imagine that the, the grand theory of gravity as complex and as many different aspects of that that there is, it's hard, it would be hard to grasp all of that in one fell swoop. And so what we'll do is we'll create certain representations of, sp of certain aspects of gravity or of whatever the thing is that we're studying so that we can make sense of that particular aspect and study that thing and create hypotheses within that. And there are lots of different types of models out there. There's statistical models that uh, within certain assumptions about data, they tell a story. You plug the data in and they tell a certain story about that data within certain assumptions. And you have conceptual models like the biopsychosocial model of pain, for example, that don't necessarily answer specific questions, but that um, create a representation of a phenomenon that allow us to maybe generate questions. So like the biopsychosocial model of pain is like, all right, this phenomenon of pain, we know this thing exists. Well, this biopsychosocial model helps us represent pain in a way where it says, oh, okay, well, there's biological, psychological, and sociological factors. Oh, well, then let's study some of these biological factors. Oh, let's study some of these psychological factors, these sociological factors. Let's maybe try to study them integrated. And, and so that conceptual model can lead to questions, lead to better questions. Um, and the thing with models is that they all come with limitations and they all come with assumptions. They have to, or else they wouldn't be models. They'd just be the world. Like, you know, if we look at a two dimensional map to get to where we're going, well, the world is not two dimensional, at least I don't think. So in a sense, that model is wrong. It comes with an assumption, but it serves the exact purpose very well for what I wanted. And actually a, a globe, which is a more accurate representation, I guess, of the earth wouldn't have done that. Um, so in rehab and in exercise, if you think about all the, the different models that you'll see out there, I used in the course Vermeil's hierarchy of, of performance as a model of rehab and training. And it tells a certain story. Vermeil's hierarchy is just a pyramid visual. And the bottom is evaluation, 
and work capacity. And then we move up the hierarchy to strength and to um, speed, the power, and then to speed up to the peak of the pyramid. And so this model tells a story about rehab, this overall concept of training and rehab. This model helps us organize thoughts and it helps us kind of give us a direction where we have this, um, this path, except of course that comes with limitations. You ask yourself, okay, so I can't do strength work before I build work capacity or I can't do power. What do all these terms even mean in the first place? Do I have to do all of these levels with, with everybody? And so you start to understand that, oh, okay, well not, no one single model is going to be the answer. And then you start looking at maybe specifically plyometric models, as well as your Vermeil's hierarchy, maybe like your big picture, kind of like how you sequence rehab in general. But then you look, go and you look at, you seek um, more specific prescriptive models on plyometrics and, and progressions for plyometrics and or for strength or sprinting or, or energy system development. And so we all do this without even realizing we have mental models of rehab. We, we literally picture these things in our head of, of how the process should go. And we learn it in school. I mean, you know, we've got all right, range of motion, strength, volume of work, increased reps. Like we have those. That's a mental model. Um, and so in the course, what I've recommend people do is just be a multi-model thinker and explore different different models and those, and those models could be like literal branded systems that people have or they could just be um you know their own really if they learn about first principles and they learn about for like ground reaction forces and they say oh well you know what i'm going to categorize my plyometrics as longer ground contact time versus short ground contact time. And I'm just going to categorize my exercises like that. And so I have counter movement type movements or like squat jumps. And then over here, I've got pogo, very elastic type exercises. And I'm going to cat and I'm going to make sure I have both of those buckets for my, for my athlete. That's a mental model that you have of plyometrics. And that's awesome. And it's probably got limitations and it's probably wrong in certain aspects of that. Um, but the fact that you even thought about that and you have that as your model and, you know, whether you have a Google doc like I do or, or not, we can at least have a conversation. If I have also thought about how I categorize and model things in my mind and the story that I tell myself about adaptations and modifications and, and, rehab progressions. Now we can have a conversation. We can compare, we can compare models and, and probably, you know, learn from each other. So theory, big picture is just the thing itself, or really the thing itself is the thing itself. The theory is all the information that we have on the thing. And then models are how we represent a certain aspect of our knowledge base for future study to future questions, try to try to put that thing into action in some in some shape or form. And we do it all the time without realizing it. How many times do you think that George Box quote has been used in the past four or five years? <laughs> it, Pro yeah, probably. I mean, it's probably a very small sector of, of the world, but like a lot in our sector. And you know what, though? Um, there's this there's this podcast where the content is great. They're super um, they're super. I think they're really entertaining. But like the content itself is way over my head. A lot of it, most of it, like ninety percent of it. But it's called Quantitude. But they actually like they hate that quote only because not because it's like wrong, not because it like they didn't like George Box or whatever. But it's people use it in a way. Like, I think, I think wrong, I think when you say the models are wrong, people have a different understanding of what that means versus models are supposed to have assumptions. Those are like the boundary conditions of the model. And they're coming at it from a, statist a statistical standpoint where they say the model isn't wrong. Your application of the model was wrong because 
you assumed linearity, and so you used a linear regression model when you should have used a factor analysis because this was far too a complex data set and a complex situation. Like you used the wrong model. So, so the models are all, yeah, they're all wrong, but they're all because that's how they were designed. They were supposed to be, they were supposed to have limitations and they come with certain assumptions and then it's on you to plug in the right type of data for, to, to match those assumptions. So in my 2D, you know, I'm looking at the street map and I'm like, well, what the hell? This doesn't tell me elevation. I'm trying to go hiking. Okay, is it, is it the wrong model's fault or are you just choosing the wrong model? You're trying to plug the wrong data in, into that model that the assumptions don't match. So yeah, uh, we use it a lot. It's in, it's in the course. It's in almost a lot of, it's in a lot of my lectures, but um, I tried, what I've tr tried to do, especially recently over the past couple of years is not just use these like quotes and end with it to try to make myself sound smart because I know that if I get pressed on certain things, like if those dudes from Quantitude are like, oh, okay, so explain that to me. And I'll be like, well, one rep max snatch. And so like, <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I think, I think, it, I think that quote and a, a lot of quotes are like that are kind of regurgitated and overused, but then they don't go into anything past that and it's almost just this random like nerd talk that doesn't have any substance so which is why i'm glad we're having this conversation now because i do think i do think clinicians don't need to go so deep on on certain things but i i do feel like understanding these concepts really helps because the questions that we get you guys i'm sure you get them like they see something on social media or they see this new continuing education course and they're like well this course said something different than the course that I went to three months ago or like, Oh, I thought, I thought you should progress plyometrics like this, but so-and-so who I really respect says they do that crap. I was wrong. You say, no, no, let's dig way down and say like, these are all mod These are all representations of something bigger. And it's, it's okay that you do something different and that don't change things right away. Consider, when you see a new model or something that's different than you do, consider it in conjunction with what you do and really dig down and ask yourself, is it all that different? And what are the differences between how they progress their plyometrics and how I progress their plyometrics? And a lot of times what you'll find is there's not that big of a difference. Like, or again, we're back to, well, he uses sets of eight, I use sets of six. The methods, how they carry it out, you know, they may use a different exercise or a different ordering, but ultimately you're both getting people out there, jumping up and down and, and progressing, you know, intensity based on the person's tolerance. Boom. And you, you know, maybe you find a new exercise, like, so I'll, I like, I'll adopt exercises that I like. Oh, I've never seen that before. You know, that's a, that's an interesting way to carry out this idea, I, I'll, I'll, I think that will now fit in my mental model, but it's not, oh, that exercise looks like a cool exercise. I should be doing that with, with my patients just because that person does it. It's where does it, where does that exercise fit within my current, within my current mental model or the, or the models that I ascribe to. And if it, if it doesn't fit, why? And if it does fit, file it away, and it, it is sell, it itself is not the principle. All right, last talking point: the creating a process. That was kind of the last portion that you've released so far in Foundations Two. Can you discuss the examples of auditing yourself and the rehab process and? elaborate on what that even means yeah so we'll say we'll call it say a process we'll use the, the word model again and just say like generally your hat went from start to finish how you interact with people is is your process it's your mental model of the journey of this person's journey from first contact to last contact now a process can be chaotic and non-repeatable, in which case you learn nothing from it, or a process can have some elements that 
that you use as, as kind of checkpoints to fall back on. And not every, no one case is going to be the same or no two cases are going to be the same, even with the same similar population, similar, um, you know, diagnosis or, or ailment. And especially since we see, tend to see a myriad of different presentations in the clinic, but your process, you're trying to find places that can be repeatable and those things you can fall back on over time as, as kind of, as your guiding light and something as, you know, there, we'll talk about a few in the course and something as simple as a needs analysis to some extent. So considering the person's goal activities keeps the end with the end in mind, what positions, what shapes do they need to get their body into? What forces and speeds do they need to be able to navigate and perform? Do they need to be able to do those things repeatedly or just one time? So are energy systems involved? Are there certain coordinative skill aspects of their goal activities? And am I the one that's going to be having an impact? So your needs analysis is one checkpoint for your process, one repeatable element that you could do on everyone. I don't care who it is. You still have a, the person with 10 years of back pain that's just general population and not active at all still has stuff that they need to be able to do. So you maintain that end in mind because those things could change over time, but that can be a way that you look back, you say, okay, revisit the needs analysis, re revisit their buckets of need, look at your program, where are they right now in comparison to where they need to go? Is my program helping to fill that gap? And then over, you know, two, three, four weeks later, you revisit the needs analysis, you revisit your program, which buckets of need have we progressed on and which haven't we? Maybe we haven't even started touching, you know, you know, uh, plyos and, and rate of forest and all those types of things. We haven't touched that yet because they weren't ready. Now they're ready. Okay. So we start to progress that. And that sounds like, well, oh, I, well, everybody does that. But sometimes we forget and sometimes we leave things out and it's really easy to six weeks goes by and you're like, oh, damn, we never actually like address this. And that's happened to me and a lot. So so a needs analysis is one of those checkpoints that you revisit and it becomes a repeatable element in your process. And then another is defining your role as a clinician. And I know this sounds really simple, too, because, well, your role is there. You need to help them. But think about. Like I, I mentioned the skill element as part of a buckets of need, like to say it's a sprinter and they pulled their hamstring. Well, sprinting is a skill, a coordinative thing, but are you there? Are you going to be their skills coach? You know, probably not. What if though, they also are seeing the athletic training staff at school and they're coming with, to you. Well, what's your role now? What are, what's the athletic training staff doing with them? Are they doing a lot of the same exercises that you're doing? If so, do you, then you need to consider that because you don't want your programs to be redundant. So these are explicit conversations that I'll have with people. It's like, all right, you're seeing this other person. Like you, you've got a program that you're doing on the side. Like, where do I fit? And I want to hear that from them. And then I'll give my, my two thought or my two cents as well. But defining your role is, is a big, is a big pillar. And that can change over time as well. You know, people may, um, want you to actually cover more over time. Maybe they start, maybe they just like you They start trusting you or they lose a coach or they, they are stopped seeing their athletic training staff. And they're like, you know what, can we start? Like I need to sprint progression cause I'm not, I moved or whatever, or they're not seeing me anymore. Um, so now your role's changed. You got to revisit your buckets of need and your exercise prescription, uh, and, and fulfill that. And if you can't, then you need to express that as well. And then another big one is defining done. So what does successful rehab, what is that actually going to look like? Is somebody with tendinopathy? So for example, I work with a lot of people with tendon issues um, that a, long a lot of times are longstanding. They've been around off and on for months, sometimes years. So how realistic is it that the last time they see me is going to be the last time they've ever felt their tendon pain. Not out of the question, but also it's what's more likely is that 
that thing is, is they still have to manage it beyond working with me. And so defining done needs to be something else other than be pain-free, never feel this thing again in a lot of these instances. So this is something that I tell, I kind of plant the seed right away um, with the, like basically what I just said, like I have that conversation with them, but we don't define it right away. We let, it, the, we let that kind of uh, manifest as we go and we'll say, okay, this person has, we've progressed to plyos, they feel really comfortable. They're coming to me and saying, hey, yeah, I had a little flare up, but I just switched it to X, Y, Z. They're starting to pick up on the process. And then, so we revisit the conversation and say, okay, defining done at some point, you feel confident in managing setbacks. You feel like you can continue this progress or you can go back to your coach and, and they feel confident because we've hit these milestones and you have this program or these things that you can fall back on. And then we define done on the outside it would look very arbitrary. You know, it could be because I was in it with this person and this person has done this amount of running and jumping and plyos and change direction and lifting. Um, we can say, all right, when you've hit these, this training load and you've hit that for four weeks straight, three weeks straight, uh, and setbacks that didn't last more than three days done. And it's a, it's a mutual conversation though. Like I just made that up off the top of my head, but it's, it's a mutual conversation where they say, yeah, I think if we got to that point, I would feel comfortable taking this, taking this on. Um, so defining done is one of those pillars that again, can make your process repeatable and, um, and keeps the, the communication lines open with your person. And then the other one, the big one that I'll hit on last one. So like we've got these checkpoints that we can fall back to is identifying the rate limiters and the leverage points. So the rate limiters are the bottlenecks. Like what is the limiting factor? I say factor, there's, there's likely many, but you know, a stupid example, but if somebody wants to put a, if their goal is to lift their arm over their head for whatever their goal activity is and their shoulder only goes to 120 degrees right now, well, range of motion is the bottleneck. We're going to be able to get really strong at that range and below. But if, you're, if your goal involves putting your arm higher than that, well, range of motion is the bottleneck. And so we're going to tailor our interventions and kind of slide the scale towards that bottleneck. The bottleneck might change over time. All right, we got range of motion back, but now you can't really handle a whole lot of load. Like you can't handle your work demands to the volume and intensity that you would need to. Okay, that's a different, that's a different quality. So now our needs... Our needs analysis and our bottleneck has changed. Our rate limiters have changed. So you're always kind of reassessing where's the rate, li what are the rate limiters? What are the rate limiters? Where are the bottlenecks? And, and how can we kind of open that up um, to, to the new bottle, to the new rate limiter? And if you're out of rate limiters, great, discharge time. Uh, but as a complementary pair with that, the leverage point is where you can intervene. Places to intervene is a leverage point in a, in a complex system is anywhere that an intervention creates change. And my recommendation is to try to find the leverage points that provide the most bang for buck with the least amount of cost. So somebody in Cali Plus just posted a case, very simple. It was a biker, um, road biker, doing like, who was training a little bit and then tr started training really hard and increased volume, but also uh, hadn't had his bike fit in like 10 years and was starting to experience, um, and, and, you know, Sam will have way more. I didn't have a whole lot to say here. All I I just identified leverage points. I said, no, nothing about bikes. Talk to this person, but start, it was starting to experience like, um, like hamstring kind of in tendon insertion discomfort. And so there were two to, in my mind, I say, okay, the rate limiter or the bottleneck is not range of motion. He's on a bike. He's got the range of motion. It's not strength. I mean, he's had you know, there's no deficit. There's no neurological deficit here. There's no acute injury. He's got the, the force production. We could, we could say the bottleneck is capacity, is tolerance to this bolus of activity. Now, the leverage points, we could always inverse the rate limiter and say, well, we work on the, the tolerance, which would be a manipulation. So our leverage point would be manipulation of dosage. So don't ride for so long. You, you increased, it was too much too soon. 
a real easy leverage point. The other leverage point, potential leverage point though, was fitting the bike. So you can ask yourself, if I did one or the other, which one would have more of an effect? If we do both, does that create too much noise? Because we often don't intervene on one thing in the clinic and I don't have a right answer. So if somebody were like, yeah, why not? Just refit and change dose. I, say, I would say fine. I just know that you won't know which one was the thing that had the effect. So, and then this is also where personal preference comes in because what if you have the conversation, this is the informed consent process, right? Say, okay, we've got two, we've got two choices here. I think everything checks out your, your tissues, knees all intact. Like you're, you know, nothing here is, is acutely damaged. It's just pissed off. But I think our, our two biggest options here that are going to give us the most bang for buck are um, reducing that 80 kilogram training session that you're hitting uh, three times a week and just reducing either the pace or the distance or we refit your bike. And now, and I honestly, as a clinician, I don't know which one is going to have the biggest effect. I'm going to guess dosage because his bike fitting hasn't been a problem for the last decade. But at the same time, maybe refitting your bike more often is also beneficial. So like I throw that out there, probably my recommendation, I say, okay, we can also try refitting though. And thinks about it, says, you know what? Honestly, like I'm riding with my team. I'm having a lot of fun. Like I don't want to cut this off. Like I'd rather try bike fitting first. I say, fine. Like worst case scenario, your hamstring is not going to pop off. Like worst case scenario, you're, it's going to hurt. And it might, it might increase the timeline of your recovery, which is annoying. But just understand that's, that is the risk that we're taking if we take this option. But he's got the means and is fine with the bike fitting. And so in that scenario, potentially, that's the leverage point that we, that we twist first. Um, that's the lever that we pull, so to speak, to address the rate limiter of tolerance. So that's, that's the other big, big checkpoint that, I'm, that, I'm always, uh, that we're always falling back on. It's, okay, what are the bottlenecks? What are the rate limiters? And then also, what, what are the leverage points? And which leverage point is going to give me the most bang for buck? And if there's multiple leverage points, that needs to be expressed to the person and have in a dialogue as part of the informed consent process. And honestly, if those things you've defined your role, you've defined done, you're on it with your current, with the needs analysis and you're current with what rate limiters you're addressing with what leverage points you want to address them with. Like that's some pretty heavy hitting big picture stuff. And like the things that you throw in the middle to carry those out that we tend to like, harp on like again sets and reps or bfr versus going to momentary muscular failure or like a knee extension versus a wall slide squat you're really there's a lot of plug and play within those those big picture principles and a lot of things will probably get you to the same end um, so really this entire this entire course is like almost trying to flip people's head people's mental models upside down a little bit we tend to go straight to the methods. And then when the methods don't work, we're lost and we're grabbing, we're grasping at straws looking for that new thing because we need a new method now because we don't have the, we don't even know why we chose it. We chose it because it looked cool. But if like, oh, okay, they just don't like, bike fitting didn't work, but the prince, but I know that I had another leverage point to, uh, to pull on here, you know, dosage. Uh, wall slides just don't work. This person just doesn't like the wall side squat. They're not like, it's just not clicking. Fine. Knee extensions, fine. Um, goblet squat with the elevated heel with the external cue, you know, in front of your knee. So it's, you start to have a lot less pressure on yourself and you start to be able to make decisions on the fly a lot better because you can just, because the method, you're not tied to that. And you, and you've got kind of plan B always at, at your side. All right. I'm done. <clears throat> Boom. Damn, dude. All right. No, right. that's great. So it's kind of wild how much you've already gone through with all of these topics. What with the rest of Foundations 2, if you want to give a little like teaser, what does it look like for the rest of uh, the mentorship and course? Yeah, it'll be the, the next big part is going to be those 
going into those four checkpoints, those four big pillars, defining done, defining your role, leverage points and rate limiters and needs analysis. And really breaking those things out into, and there will be some methods that go into that, but really, really breaking those things out and um, making them meaningful and applicable and getting people to be able to take those ideas and implement them into their practice, into their process right, you know, right away, right now, um, no matter the setting. And then beyond, and then beyond that, we, we will start digging into, um, dosage and programming and methods, the stuff that people want. If they, but if they stay around, like the cool thing about the way the course is in Calu plus is it's not like over a weekend where you feel pressured to like, you can't just have an entire day on complexity. Like people, you're going to lose people. They're not going to get anything out of that. But the way it's embedded now is that we have the time and um, the reflections that I'm having people do, I think is going to really help to solidify some of this information. Like I'm making them go find models on a certain topic and compare them. And like, if they do the work, it's very similar to what Sam was saying earlier with his, with, with what he did with nerves and, and hip pain, like people are going to have to take some deep dives, but they're going to come out of that with just a, such a, a broader understanding of really just what we know and what we don't know about exercise prescription and figuring out that there's still so much we don't know is actually pretty liberating because you don't feel pressure to be right and wrong because you know that even the experts in the field don't have all the answers. Um, and so you start to be okay with that. And then, and then you can be more free and, and experiment, experiential with your exercise prescription in a good way. Uh, but that's kind of where the direction that we're going to head, we're going to break out those checkpoints and then we're going to start to, uh, dig into the nitty gritty of, of programming strategies. <clears throat> Boom. That's great. Sam, any other final thoughts or comments before we call it? If I want to learn more about gravity, where do I go? Mm. Cause I feel like you're just dropping all these gravity bombs on me, Quinn. Well, uh, I don't think I, I think I just used the word. I would say, um, let's see. I was going to say, Look up some Einstein. Go read, <laughs> go read Einstein. That'd probably be... I Did mean, they talk about that on that Quantitude podcast? Relativity is a good place to start. Is huh? that, on Quantitude, is that... Uh, were you, did they discuss it on there? Uh, I don't... You made reference think, to it a few times. I, I, it was really good in context. I don't, I don't know if they do. They would know more than me, though, for sure. Mm. Um, I know mm. I've got this model that in the course that... It's just a big ball and a small ball and the big ball warps space time more. And so I know that. Mm. That's all I got. Nice. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Quinn. Excited for the rest of Foundations 2 to come out. For people that want to take the course or are interested in all this material, how do people actually have access to it? Yeah. So we, f we filter out. We, so we make people apply. And, um, we actually make them like reflect on if they really want to do it. And if they're like, they're truly like at the place where they want to take on something like that. So the applications are in everywhere that we share links. So any of the level at level up and clinical athlete bios, you'll see the link to the foundations to application. Um, if you can't find that, you can email me at Quinn at clinical athlete.com. We're, we kind of open and close the applications at certain times so that we can actually have conversations. So it's not just an app and then we send you a link. It's an application and we talk to you on the phone or on Skype or, or Zoom. Nobody uses Skype. Um, but we're at, but it, it's one of those. So think about it if you're ready. Um, but there's no, there's no cost or anything to fill out, at least fill out the application and have a conversation and learn more about it. So obviously I'd, I'd encourage people to do that if you feel it's beneficial. Solid. All right. Thanks again, Quinn. Yeah, thanks.